Okay, I'm going to uh, focus on a, a much narrower uh, portion of the democratization uh, puzzle, and that's um, on elections. Um, and uh, as Joe said, uh, elections are not the you know be all and end all of democracy. They are an, an important part, but it is so much. Um, democracy is so much more. Um, that said, I I want to focus on elections because our attention as the international community is really drawn to elections. And in many cases, that tends to, that, that's also a focal point within African countries. And, you know, I think we can think back on certainly the troubled elections, those that have kind of bubbled up through our uh, own media. So more recently, um, you, you may have heard about, you know, the elections in Zimbabwe. There's a lot of anticipation that were, that, that preceded, uh, the August elections because of a number of things. One, uh, Robert Mugabe wasn't on the ballot. Um, two, uh, the last time that there was a uh, credible opposition was in 2008. And at that time, when uh, the election had to go to a second round, there was so much violence that the opposition actually withdrew from the contest. So there is a lot of you know, anticipation, uh, lots of, uh, you know, kind of worst case scenario planning. And um, in the end, what happened was there wasn't as much violence as there was in 2008. Um, there, there was some violence and six people uh, did lose their lives and there's lots of other types of intimidation, uh, but it didn't turn out to look like what it was in 2008. Uh, Kenya in um, August of last year, of 2017, again, a contest that was preceded by um, a number of violent incidents, and certainly because of how violent the, you know, Kenya's elections um, have been, uh, that was also kind of, uh, you know, looked, looked to with a lot of trepidation. And, you know, in a surprise, um, uh, turn of events, the Kenyan Supreme Court annulled the the first round of elections and asked the the um, electoral commission to organize another round of elections uh, another uh, three months later, and so that was a surprise um, to many uh, Kenya watchers. Um, but others have also gone well, and um, the elections in, in Sierra Leone, even though they were contested, the result was contested. That you know, we didn't hear much about those or um, the elections in Liberia, apart from the fact that Ellen Johnson Sirleaf was not, you know, going to contest uh, because she'd met her two terms. Uh, we didn't hear much about that or the elections in Ghana in 2016. Again, you know, so things, you know, things can go well and things can go very, very badly. And I think it's important to understand when, um, you might have either outcome. Sometimes you can have, um, and it varies by country. So, you know, the Nigerian elections, um, you've seen them go well one round, and then um, you get something like 2011, where they had um, more violence than uh, they've had in any of their other um, any of their other elections. Looking over the horizon, lots of concern over the DRC. Uh, for a long time, for the last two years, actually, it wasn't clear if President Kabila was going to step down. And he just named his successor, so it looks, you know, looks like uh, he won't be contesting. But now it's not clear if they're going to have elections at the end of the year. Um, and if they do, what kind of elections are they going to have? They're, they are really behind uh, in terms of all of the things that they need to do and also quite underfunded. Um, Nigeria of 2019, also a lot of uncertainty there, especially because there's been a lot of uh, defections from President Buhari's party. And so what is that going to look like? And then just thinking again, you know, a little further on down the line, uh, Togo 2020. In um, West Africa, Togo is the only country that hasn't um, adopted a uh, two-term limit. And um, currently now they've been undergoing protests for a number of years. 
among civil society and the opposition of requesting that the president step down, requesting that you know there are major changes to the Electoral Commission. So lots of uncertainty in those countries. So what has been uh, the experience um, uh, of Africa with elections? The graph that Joe showed with the, um, I'll just go back here, um, with this up and down of democracy and autocracies and intermediate regimes um, is kind of an indication that um, if you, especially if you look at the democracy line, you'll see that, um, at least how I read it, is that, you know, there's a lot of um, slippage in democracy. So you take a few steps back, a few steps forward and a few steps back. Um, and it really is um, a process. If we look um, at elections, um, uh, oh, so ignore that value. That was just a cut and paste <laughs> error. Um, so this looks at elections since 1990. And I picked 1990 because, as I said yesterday, that's when we kind of mark the democratization process starting on the continent. And this um, describes uh, 330 or so elections, presidential parliamentary elections on the continent. And um, uh, what um, they are grouped into four areas. One is no violence, so you know, no violence at all. Uh, the second is what we call violent harassment, and that includes um, intimidation, uh, but again, no fatalities. Then the second category is violent repression. So this might be targeted assassinations. It might be um, uh, protests that have been um, violently met. And um, you do have fatalities, but no more than 20 in that whole um, process before or after the elections. And the last is large scale violence. And that's kind of what we, what the news that maybe reaches us who aren't you know, following Africa closely. That would be Kenya or Nigeria. And those are essentially um, um, in elections where you have fatalities of greater than 20. And what we find is that 42% um, uh, of all elections in this period um, have not had any violence. But that also tells us the majority have had some type of violence. Within that, uh, most are not the large-scale violence. So most elections don't look like Kenya or Cote d'Ivoire or Togo or Nigeria, uh, but rather um, most, most um, participants, most contestants, most citizens will experience some level of intimidation and harassment that does seem to be the norm. And how has that, how has this looked over time? It's looked like this. And this is um, not at all what was anticipated in, at, at the start of um, the democratization process. So democracy was thought to be another way to contest politics uh, without violence. But instead, we see this very jagged line. And so at um, one level, it tells us that um, politics continues to be um, violent on the continent. And so that gives us an indication that um, the institutions that are have been um, supposed to govern elections have not been um, really doing their job. So elections um, become uh, unpredictable. Um, and that's sort of not the good news, is that you know, we are not seeing a sustained uh, decrease um, in violence. Some other things um, about um, violence in African elections is that 95% of all the violence happens before the election. And I think that there's a lot of focus on election day, and there's a lot of focus on the, the day, you know, the period after elections. But um, most of the violence happens before the votes are even cast. The second uh, thing to note is that institutions really do matter. And so when we look at where violence has taken place, um, we see that it takes place when there are close elections and weak institutions. Uh, that's a rough, um, sort of a rough conclusion. But, you know, to an anecdote to kind of illustrate that point is to contrast um, uh, Ghana in uh, 2012 and um, 
uh, Kenya in 2008. And so what happened in those two contests? Well, well, um, in Kenya 2000, sorry, Kenya 2007, uh, the, the incumbent was Mwai Kibaki, and he was going up against Raila Odinga. And um, when the Electoral Commission declared that Mwai Kibaki was the winner, um, under very murky circumstances, and we can get into that later, um, Raila Odinga decided that he was not going to go through the courts because he, and he said this publicly, that he didn't feel he was going to get a fair hearing. The court system, he was calling his supporters into the streets. And what did that, and you know, what did that mean? Well, it meant that um, four months later, about 1,500 Kenyans lost their lives and um, more than a half a million were displaced. You contrast that a few years later with what happened in Ghana in 2012. And, um, and, and I should say that in both cases, there are very, very close, um, there are very close elections. Uh, in the Ghanaian case, the, um, the incumbent, the, the president, um, was declared the winner. And uh, the opposition leader, Na Nana Addo, decided that he would go through the courts. And actually, and, and uh, what he said was, even before the uh, result was, or the, the court had made its decision, he said, we're going to abide by whatever the court says. So he publicly committed to abiding by, you know, whatever the, the court um, decided because he felt that he would get a fair hearing. And in fact, he did, even though the court decided against him, he accepted that decision. He came out and he said, we accept that decision. And they went back to planning for the next contest, which was 2016. And so in both cases, they were um, close elections. They were both contested by the opposition. But in one case, the opposition leader decided that he was going to um, use the judicial process to um, um, contest the results. And in the other case, the opposition leader decided he would not get a fair hearing and he was going to violently, or he was going to use the streets, which resulted in violence. So that's one um, case in which we can think of, you know, for trying to plan, uh, trying to prevent violence, look at the institutions um, and see where um, you are likely to, where an opposition leader is likely to think that they will get a good, uh, a fair hearing. Another instance in which we are more likely to see uh, violence is, you know, impunity. And that actually, unfortunately, applies to almost um, every country or every case on the continent. Very, very rarely have um, electoral offenses been punished. You might get low level. Um, uh, people who've committed offenses at lower levels um, to face some kind of uh, punishment, but in most cases, it doesn't happen. And the and the, the highest profile case is again the 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 Kenyan case. And after 2007, six prominent Kenyan leaders, um, including the president and the vice president, were indicted by the ICC. But their case eventually fell apart. And uh, because the witnesses disappeared, they recanted, um, and they were not able to build the case. So um, they contested again in 2017, and um, and uh, and they won. Um, another thing to remember is that the past is prologue in many cases. So what we tend to see is many countries have repeat cycles of electoral violence. And you might think of this as, as a more traditional type of conflict. And so uh, what we see is political actors manipulating existing grievances. And sometimes those grievances recur in a particular region. So sometimes that might be um, an ethnic um, a grievance or ethnic competition. And so uh, the Rift Valley in Kenya um, with land issues, with um, issues of um, um, different ethnic groups coming in and settling, those um, differences might be manipulated by political actors during election time. Or in northern Ghana, uh, there are chieftaincy disputes, there are land disputes that are repeatedly manipulated 
or the, fa the flames are fanned um, every four years uh, during election time. Um, and there are many ca other cases on the continent where we see that um, existing grievances result in, in their manipulation um, during, um, during elections. When, when else might we see uh, violence? When there's a fear of losing. And it's, um, you know, whether uh, it looks like lots of um, steps have been put in place to, to um, block um, fraud. Maybe they go to a, uh, there's a more robust observation presence. Maybe they're just more secure steps. And so you have leaders that are, um, that fear losing a contest and then um, the only tool left in their toolbox is a, um, is to use violence. Um, another way to think about this is that violence is a, um, is a tool that is used strategically. Sometimes it's used to displace uh, voters. Uh, sometimes it's even used to get people to come out to vote. Um, and uh, what we found is that um, those receiving the violence understand understand that message. Um, the um, after the the Kenyan uh, violence in 20, 2007, there was a very extensive uh, investigation by um, the Waki Commission. Uh, the Waki Judge Waki led that commission, and um, what is what is clear in the um, in this 500-page report is the strategic use of violence, is the level of planning that goes into um, in, into the violence. So um, that tells us that it's it's been used um, as a as a tool. Well, what can we do for interested in preventing um, violence? Um, are there um, examples around the continent uh, that tell us how uh, violence can be um, prevented. And I will tell you that, in fact, there are. So one thing to do is um, to intervene early. Uh, I, I said that 95% of all violence happens before the election, and so um, in, in many cases, that is um, many, many months. It could even be a, a year <laughs> before um, the election happens. So um, going back to another example in Kenya, um, before the 1992 election, which was their first multi-party election, um, violence happened about 18 months or even a year before. And this was the incumbent, Daniel Arab Moy, um, um, and his um, political uh, allies engineering these ethnic clashes. And that again displaced about 1,500, uh, sorry, killed about 1,500 people before the election and displaced about a half a million, all before, um, about even one year before the, um, the election uh, took place. So um, we need to intervene early. And that uh, includes also investing in early warning, early response platforms. So one of the things we know um, about elections is something we don't know in any other type of conflict. We know the date, we know the political actors, and if we do some homework, we understand um, motives and incentives. And that gives us a lot more information than in other conflicts that you know, we might say, well, that kind of you know, came out of the blue, although no nothing ever really does. Uh, another is to ex expand the circle of monitors. Um, the more eyes you have in a process, the less um, chance there is of it being manip manipulated. And it sounds you know, very trite, but oftentimes, um, especially at the domestic level, we might see restrictions or you know, it's, uh, or international actors might not be invited. Um, but if you expand um, the levels um, expand the circle of monitors, ex expand the circle of stakeholders, you have a lot more actors that are vested in having a more peaceful process or have the capacity to intervene when something is about to go awry. An example, um, 
would be, uh, you can take Malawi, and there are many examples of these types of domestic monitors. Malawi has something called the um, 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 uh, local multi-party, uh, sorry, I'm messing that name up, but essentially these uh, monitors at the local level are made up of um, their civil society, their political parties, they also um, have security forces you know, within them, and um, at the sign of conflict or tension, they will bring, um, bring together the, uh, the political parties. In some cases, there have been, at least in um, one case, people have uh, faced criminal charges or lost their jobs um, for engaging in, in violence. In the um, case of uh, Sierra Leone, they have um, district level um, um, observation committees, and they actually are empowered to um, prosecute uh, those who violate so-called code of conduct. Um, in Ghana, there are um, domestic uh, observers that um, plan out, along with the security forces, they will plan out where the hotspots are, they send observers to those hotspots, they have reports coming back to the committee, to a central committee, those reports are investigated and decisions are made as to whether or not those uh, violation, violations should be attended to through security, is it, is it uh, something that goes to the media, is it something that goes, has to be mediated through perhaps a respected community leader. So, you know, Understanding, you know, what the conflict is and how to be, how it's to be mediated, can make a difference in whether or not that escalates into something much more serious. And we find that at the domestic level, that capacity is a lot stronger than even at the international level. Um, in Ghana's case, there are about, you know, there's several thousand, six to eight thousand domestic observers, and there are nowhere near that many international observers. Uh, but they are also empowered and they are trained to understand you know, what violence looks like, and more importantly, that, those, those, um, that um, very inclusive group of stakeholders are brought to bear on, um, on violence and how to mitigate it. And that seems to make a difference. Another thing is to understand the context. Uh, violence tends to recur, but not all the time. And sometimes, um, it depends on um, the international context. It depends on who the political actors are. And so in, in many ways, each case is unique. I mean, there are some historical patterns and we need to be mindful of that, but political actors you know, respond to a particular context. We need to understand um, when there are incentives and when there are capacities to, um, to use violence. And so identifying conflict drivers identifying the stakeholders, their motivations, and the means uh, by which they can commit, commit these acts. The second, and Joe alluded to this, is strengthening key institutions. The electoral body, electoral commission, the security sector, um, and not necessarily um, the security sector so that they can you know, strengthen the regime, but how, um, how do you um, professionalize the security sector, as Joe said, how do you allow um, people to protest without also fearing, you know, uh, for their lives. The, the judiciary, I gave you the example of um, Ghana and Kenya, but there are other examples where the opposition has chosen to go through the courts versus through the streets, and that depends on what they expect. So I'll stop there, and uh, we'll take your questions later. Next.